Hi everyone, welcome to church. We'd like to give you a special warm welcome this morning if this is the first time you've joined us with Church Online on a Sunday. We're going to come around now for a little time of worship and we would love for you just to engage in that moment where you are, yes, right there in your home this morning. Come down, oh creation, everything with a breath repeat this sound, all his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God, his name is Jesus, oh, swing wide, oh you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down, oh creation. Everything with the breath repeat this sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. So don't let your heart be drunk. to 
courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our hell comes from. Oh, remember where hell comes from. This morning, we would love to pray for you. We do this every week because we know the importance of it. You know God hears us when we pray. He said, ask and I will do it. And there are lots of needs because we're in this difficult time and the circumstances with the virus. We're so glad that there's been an answer to prayer. Our Prime Minister is home safe, praise the Lord. Uh, but we want to continue for our government. They have important decisions to make and we want to continue to pray for you. We know that you have decisions to make and you know jobs and healing and provision god wants to bless you let's pray together at church and let's agree in faith as we pray father we thank you today that we can come to you in the name of jesus we thank you lord that there is power in the name and lord as we exercise our faith we put our trust in that name and the power of that name we thank you lord for delivering our prime minister from that virus we pray you keep your hand on him, that Lord, you will give him the spirit of wisdom and understanding of decisions, God, that our government need to make at this time. Lord, heal our land, protect those on the front lines, God, out there working to help sick people. But Father, we just pray for each person in their home this morning, every need, God, to be met. Lord, whether it be financial or healing or emotional, we thank you, Jesus, that you are the healer. We've just celebrated Easter and we remember that Christ is risen, our Redeemer and our healer. So Lord, we commit ourselves to you this week again and we say, Holy Spirit, move through our lives. And Lord, we thank you that we belong to you and we can have confidence that when we ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you will do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Defender behind me, I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing. My cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm.
I'm really excited about what I'm going to share with you this morning. So if you've got your Bibles with you, let's go to Proverbs in chapter 4. I want to talk about the heart of man or the spirit of man. And I want to take a, a text from a great hero of the Old Testament called Caleb, one of the things that God said about him. But we're going to get there in a moment. Let's begin reading from Proverbs chapter 4, uh, starting with verse 20. It reads, and I'm, I'm reading from the New King James translation, so just bear with me if yours is slightly different. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Now notice the impact, the effects of God's word in your heart. Verse 22 says, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. I'm going to read the next verse in a moment, but these verses are really key. If you want to study the, the healing ministry of Jesus, these, these verses are really key in the way that he practiced his ministry. Because you'll read several times in the New Testament, in the Gospels, that Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and healing and a lot of people want the healing but what Jesus gave them first was the word and that's what this talks about pay attention to God's word incline your ear to my sayings do not let them depart from your eyes keep them in the midst of your heart for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh and you notice the people many people that were healed in Jesus ministry it says and you find this more in in Luke's gospel he said they came to hear and to be healed we're not talking about that so much uh, this morning but what I do want to focus on is what Paul, uh, the writer here says in verse 23 the New King James translation says keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life when he's talking about the heart here, and you'll find this uh, is consistent in, in the Bible, when the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about this physical organ that pumps blood around your body. 
Remember Paul said in the book of Romans that with the heart man believes. Well, you couldn't believe with this physical organ called the heart any more than you could with your lungs, your liver, or your kidneys. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about the spirit of man, the center or the core of man's being. So verse 23 says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life or the wellsprings of life. Listen to what the NIV says. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Notice those words, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart, protect your heart. We guard many things in life, don't we? Uh, I remember there was a day when we used to be able to go out of the house. And when we used to leave the house, we used to make sure the doors were locked, the windows were closed. We set the alarm if we had one. We guard the house. Uh, my car's on the drive, just outside of my front door. But you know, every night I make sure it's locked. I, I wait for the lights to flash, I press the button, and I know it's alarmed. We guard things that are monetary value. We guard and we protect things that are of sentimental value. The scripture says the most important thing of all for you to guard, above all else, you should guard your heart. Because the life you live does not come out of the house that you occupy, the car that you drive, or any of the things that you possess. The life that you live comes out of the heart that you have. And so God is very interested in our heart, the condition of our heart. And I want to share some thoughts with you along those lines. And, and, and I really want you to take these on board and, and guard your heart, but then also develop your spirit nature, develop your spirit. man. Because what this verse is telling us is that our heart is our responsibility. Our spirit is our responsibility. We are the custodians. We are the guardians of our heart. And God gives us his word so that we can know what to do with our hearts, what we can do with our minds, what we can do with our bodies. But we're going to focus on what God wants us to do with our hearts. Let's go over to the Old Testament again, to Numbers and chapter 14. And I want to read something here about Caleb, what God said about Caleb. Now, the story is that the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. And, you know, that generation, I would say they experienced signs and wonders like no other generation before them. Uh, there were plagues that were throughout Egypt. Basically, it was God's judgment on Egypt. Uh, but they were protected. And uh, it, it was like, like I've said before, Psalm 91 before is written. They were protected in Goshen while a judgment fell all around them. They, they experienced signs and wonders. They came out of Egypt. God said, the Bible says he brought them out with a mighty hand. He brought them out with silver and gold. There was not one feeble person amongst their tribes. He brought them through the Red Sea. What a miracle that was where God actually divided the Red Sea. And they went through on dry ground and they had a glory meeting on the other side. They experienced signs and wonders like no other generation before or any generations, generation since. But it didn't make spiritual giants out of them. Such an interesting thing that they experienced the power of God and witnessed it with their own eyes, but it never made spiritual giants out of them. And it's not really for us to point the finger and be critical of them. It's for us to learn the lesson. These things are written for our example. So we want to see the lessons that we can learn, that our spiritual development is not necessarily based on signs and wonders that we see. It's based on our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with his word and what he says and how it impacts our lives. It's very interesting to me that there were uh, 10 plagues that came uh, over Egypt, which the children of Israel were protected from. And between Egypt and the Promised Land, there were 10 challenges. And there will always be challenges in life. 
None of us are immune. Whether our faith is strong or our faith, faith is weak, we will always experience challenges. But God equips us for the challenges of, of life. And the sad thing about them is that every time they face the challenge, rather than rising up to the challenge, they shrink, they shrunk back in fear and in doubt, in unbelief, with murmurings and complainings. And they did this nine times. And then the tenth time was when they came to the borders of the Promised Land. And you may remember how that Moses chose a leader from each of, each of the 12 tribes to go and spy out the land. And they did that for 40 days and 40 nights. They came, they brought their report to Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation was listening in. They all agreed it's a wonderful land. It's flowing with milk and honey, but then there was a division. And 10 of them started to talk about the challenges. They started to talk about the problems. They started to focus and and talk about the things that were against them. And when the people heard this, they were discouraged and they were up in arms. And, and then they started to blame God. They started to blame Moses and Aaron. And they said, God has brought us out here to die in the wilderness. We should go back to Egypt. Wish we'd never left Egypt. Now think about that. Wish we'd never left Egypt. We were better off there where they were slaves, where they had no rights, where they were not cared for. And uh, so they started to say these negative things. And then Caleb and Joshua stood up amongst them. And they said, no, let's go up at once because we are well able to take the land. And the 10 argued with him. And unfortunately, the people went with the majority report. The majority was not in faith. The majority did not take God's side. The majority did not focus on the promises of God. They focused on the problems that were before them. And God said, that's enough. Uh, I've had enough of this generation. Um, they will have exactly what they said in my hearing. Then he said something uh, to Moses in Numbers chapter 14, beginning with verse 22. This is God speaking to Moses. He said, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me now to the test these 10 times, and have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Now listen to this, verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully. One, tra one translation says, he's followed me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land where he went and his descendants will inherit it. What a tragedy. But of all the people that came out of Egypt and, and they give us different figures. Sometimes it's, it's you know, hundreds of thousands, but most scholars believe it was somewhere between two and three million people. Two and three million or three million people. That of all the men who were 20 years old and above, the Bible says only two entered in. Two entered in. And again, let me say, it's, it's not for us to look back and be critical of them, it's for us to learn the lesson. What distinguished Caleb and Joshua? from everybody else. What made it possible for him to enter in? What made it possible for him to experience the promises of God? What made it possible for him to experience the perfect will of God for his life? Notice what God said. It wasn't because he was more popular. In fact, he was very unpopular at this time, the people spoke about stoning him. So it wasn't his popularity. It wasn't what the people thought of him. It wasn't his family name. It wasn't that he was head and shoulders and physically in stature above everybody else. Remember, it says about Saul that he was head and shoulders above. It wasn't his physical stature. It wasn't his keen intellect. God doesn't refer to his intellect. 
Notice the thing that distinguished Caleb from everybody else. God says in verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land where he went and his descendants will inherit it. It wasn't just about him. It was about those that were coming after him. And friends, if we're going to live the life that God has for us, if we're going to overcome the challenges, if we're going to rise up to the challenges and overcome them, if we're going to come out of these days strong and, and possessing what God has for us, we have to have a different spirit. Caleb's spirit was not subject to the circumstances that he found himself in. He actually, his spirit was a dominating spirit. A spirit. He wanted to dominate his circumstances. He didn't want his circumstances controlling him. He wanted to control them. He knew that God was on his side. And what God said was more true than what his circumstances said. So he had a different spirit, a dominating spirit. It was greater than the tests and the trials that he was facing. It was greater than the problems. You see, a different spirit sees differently. A different spirit thinks differently. A different spirit is committed differently. We have to have a different spirit. It believes differently. We have to have a different spirit. If we're going to enter into the promised land that God has for us, if 2020 is going to be what God wants it to be for us individually and corporately as a church, we have to have that spirit of faith. We have to have a spirit of seeing and knowing where, where we have vision and know that what God says is more true than the temporal circumstances we find ourselves in. Just like Caleb, we have to have a different spirit. And I want to remind you again that this is our responsibility. Our heart is our responsibility. Our, our spirit is our responsibility. God has given us all the means whereby we can be strong spiritually. Like we said a few weeks ago, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's done everything we need in order to be strong in the Lord, to have a different spirit, a dominating spirit, no matter what comes against us. That we're not intimidated by the lies of the enemy. We're not intimidated by the circumstances we find ourselves in. We're not intimidated by negative thoughts that run through our mind or, or negative emotions. We have strength that comes from within. A different spirit, a strong spirit, a dominating spirit when it comes to dealing with the enemy and things that are wrong in our lives. Let's go over to the New Testament. And I, I want to read from Matthew in chapter 12. Jesus here um, gives some interesting insight into the heart and, and what we can do, what we must do in order to make the condition of our heart right and conduce it so that God can do what he wants uh, to do in and through us. It's very important to know that the channel through which God flows it is not our mind and, and it's not our feeling and our physical senses. The channel through which God flows uh, to impact our lives is our heart is our spirit. Remember Proverbs says, uh, for out of your heart flows the issues of life. And the life you live, uh, let me say this again, the life you live comes out of the heart that you have. You see, there are people who uh, can actually find themselves in positive circumstances, but they can be lonely, they can be discouraged, they can be depressed because it's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. On the other hand, there, there are people in, and your heart goes out to them because of the plight they find themselves in and the circumstances they find themselves in. But if you have a conversation with them, they're, they're positive, they've got a spirit of faith. They, for them, the glass is always half full. For them, there's light at the end of the tunnel. For them, you know, Goliath's not too big to hit, he's too big to miss. People who have a different spirit, they, they, they don't just see the obstacle, they see the opportunity. 
They don't just see the problem, they see the possibility. And so Jesus gives us some insight in Matthew chapter 12 about uh, what we can do in order to guard our heart and to have a different spirit. Reading from verse 33, Jesus begins, this verse begins with the words, either. And that word on its own lets us know that there is a choice. And friends, we always have a choice. You always have a choice. Sometimes we, we lock ourselves into mindsets and attitudes and ways of thinking that become a pattern and a habit. And we, we can definitely feel that we don't have a choice, that this is the way I am. And, and we're locked into that. But God's word has come to free us and let us know that you do have a choice. God said to the children of Israel in, in Deuteronomy, you choose. Choose this day he will, you will serve and choose life, choose blessing. And I love what Joshua said. He said, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. He chose to serve the Lord. And the way we do that is by choosing to obey his word and believe his word. Jesus says, you have a choice. And here he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Now, whatever you think he's talking about, he's not talking about the kind of tree you have in your garden or, or out in the woodlands. He's actually talking about your heart. And he says, you choose. And you can either make your heart good or you can make it bad. You can make your spirit good or you can make it bad condition of your spirit, the type of spirit. Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. A tree is known by its fruit. Now notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, ask God to make the tree good. And he didn't say, make sure the devil doesn't make the tree bad. He didn't say, ask God to make it good, your heart good. And make sure the devil doesn't make your heart bad. He said, you choose. And that's why it's so important we be people of the word, that we read our Bibles on a daily basis, because God is constantly talking to us and dealing with us about how we ought to live our lives and, and the things that he has made possible and the things that he has done, and the things he wants us to believe and appropriate to our lives so that we can make the tree good the heart good, and so the things that flow out will also be good. Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. The tree is known by its fruit. You see, generally, I think we can apply this to every area of life. If you want something to be good, you have to make it good. You have to be intentional about it. If you want your marriage to be good, you have to be intentional about it. They lived happily ever after is in the fairy tales. Real life, you have to make it good. You have to make marriage good. You have to let make relationships good. You have to make church good. It's not just up to the pastor. God, I hope the pastor makes church good. No, every single one of us are a part of it. And if we want church to be good, we have to make it good. And it seems, you know, in this world that things are, are in a natural state of decay and decline. I'm not, a, I'm not a particularly clean gardener. I like the benefits of having a nice garden. I just don't like the work that's involved in having a nice garden. My wife's passionate about garden. She, she loves being out there. It's therapeutic for her. Uh, all you have to do to have a bad garden is nothing. Just watch, watch lots of TV, watch lots of Netflix, Netflix and, uh, and in the process of time, without any effort whatsoever, you will have a, a bad garden. If you want it to be good, you have to make it good. And if you want your heart to be good, if you want your heart to be strong, if you, ha if you want your heart to be keen and, and like Caleb, different, 
uh, so that he dominated the negative circumstances and, and dominated the problems that came against him. You have to make it good. And Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. He goes on in verse 34 to say, brood of vipers. Uh, how many of you know Jesus could communicate in such a way that he was not misunderstood? He said, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, Jesus is saying that we can tell the condition of your heart by what comes out of your mouth. He goes on in verse 35 to say, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man or a bad man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. I think it's very interesting that uh, what God referred to, how God referred to the ten spies and what they said. I think the old King James translation says, they brought up an evil report of the land. They were all God's people. They all came out of Egypt. They all came through the Red Sea. And that's a, that's a type for us today. Them coming out of Egypt is a type of us coming out of the world. Then going through the Red Sea is a type of water baptism. And their promised land is a type of the life that God has given to us. It's a type of the abundant life that Jesus came for us to enjoy. It's a type of the spiritual promised land, every blessing that is ours in Christ Jesus that God wants us to experience here in this life. Uh, their promised land is a type of that for us. And uh, uh, he, he said they brought up an evil report of the land. They, they all agreed it's a good land, but the fact that they started to say things that were contrary to what God was saying, God considered it evil. The others, Joshua and Caleb, brought a good report because what they were saying was in line with God's word. God's given it to us. We can go and possess it. God is on our side. There's, there's problem, there are problems there, but they are bread for us. So what they were saying was true as far as the facts were concerned, the physical realities, but they were limited by the reality, realities of what they were experiencing. They were, they were limited by the wars. They were limited by the size of the giants. Because their final word was what the giants were saying to them and what the walls were saying to them, God said, it's a report of unbelief. It's full of fear. It is contrary to what I say. It's an evil report. It was a bad report as far as God was concerned. Joshua and Caleb, their confession, the words of their mouth was exactly in line with God's words, with what God had promised. And Jesus said here, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. A bad man or an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. It's fascinating. They were all God's people, like I've said. But they constantly spoke contrary to what God was saying. They constantly murmured. They constantly complained. And it caused them to forfeit the blessing that God had for them. You see, what, what Jesus is saying here is that we will bring forth in life out of the treasure that's in our hearts. Now, I'm not saying that if we have a problem, then the reason why we have that problem is because of the condition of our hearts. You know, everybody on planet Earth, basically everybody on planet Earth is under the shadow of this coronavirus. Everybody's aware, everybody has to be locked in, everybody has to keep socially distant from other people if they're out in public places. So everybody's experiencing this, but how are we responding to it? The condition of your heart determines that response. The condition of your heart determines the response to problems, to challenges, 
to difficulties. The condition of your heart is determining what comes out of your mouth. And for us to come out of this strong, we have to have a different spirit. And Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart. You see, he has been storing up in his heart good things. He's been building into his heart, into his spirit, a consciousness of good things. He's not just focusing on the problems. He's not just focusing on what's against him. It's because what you put in is what comes out. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes it leaks, but it does come out positively or negatively. There's an interesting statement that Jesus made in, in Matthew chapter 6. He said, if your eye is good, you'll see light. But if your eye is bad, you'll see darkness. And if the light that you have is dark, how great is that darkness? Now, he's not talking about the condition of your eyes and you know, you should have gone to spec savers. Uh, he's not talking about your eyesight. He's talking about not what you see or what you see with, but how you see. You see, how you see determines whether you stand or fall. How you see determines whether you step forward or whether you're not back. How you see determines whether you possess or whether you spend the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness. How you see determines whether you overcome or whether you are overcome. And how you see is determined by the condition of your heart. So how do you make the, the, the tree good? How do you build a good treasure in your heart so that you can bring forth good things in life? Go back to Proverbs chapter 4. Reading from verse 20. He said, Pay attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. And you know, in closing, I just want to remind you, Joseph, how that he didn't have a written Bible. Um, he didn't have the Old Testament even. It's before... Uh, the, the first five books of the Old Testament were written, but God spoke to him. And let me just remind you that the written word of God is more sure than any dream or any vision or any audible voice that we could hear from God. God spoke to him in a dream. And he, you remember how that uh, they were out there in the field bringing the sheaves and his sheaves stood up and his brothers bowed down to him. See, that became... Uh, God speaking to God's word to him and, and he had paid attention to it. He listened to it. He kept it before his eyes. Perhaps unwisely he shared it with his brothers who despised him for it, but it became the treasure in his heart. And you see throughout the different stages of his life, he brought forth in life out of the treasure that was in his heart. In circumstances positive and in circumstances that were negative, Joseph brought forth out of the treasure that was in his heart. He embraced it, he kept it, he wouldn't let go of it, and his life began to produce the good fruit. In, uh, in his father's house, in Potiphar's house, remember he became the head and everybody else was listening to him. In prison, he started to run the prison, and then eventually we see the ultimate fulfillment, where he was second in command in the whole of Egypt, and his brothers literally coming down and bowing before him. We see how that Joseph brought forth in life out of the treasure that was in his heart. And that could be your story, that could be my story. God has given us his word, and his word frames a picture, it frames a dream, it creates a vision that God has for our lives. It creates a picture of the promised land he wants us to go and possess. And if we'll build a consciousness of that and a belief in our heart to renew our minds to what God's word says, then we can have a different spirit. and We can dominate the circumstances and the problems that we experience in life. And we can bring forth in life out of the treasure that's in our hearts to the glory of our Heavenly Father so that He is honored, Jesus is glorified, and the Holy Spirit has His way and does His work in our lives. I want to, to encourage you to take that on board 
and 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 meditate upon these things and allow these verses to become part of of the way that you do life uh, and let's have a different spirit god has given us his holy spirit but our spirit our heart has to cooperate with what the holy spirit wants to do uh, and what he wants to do is written in black and white throughout the pages of the script and especially the new testament so let's have a different spirit be the kind of men and women that god wants us to be in jesus name amen we're going to have communion now uh, but before we have communion, I'm just aware that there will be people watching and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You see, the first step to having a different spirit is to be born again. The Bible says that the moment we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts, we acknowledge uh, that he is raised from the dead, that he died for our sin, but God raised him up. We confess him as Lord. We are born again. That, that's a spiritual experience. It's a spiritual rebirth and actually the book of Corinthians says we become new creatures in Christ Jesus and that's the first step to having a different spirit so there's anyone out there those of you that don't have a relationship with Jesus those of you that don't know that you've been born again I want to lead you in a simple prayer to invite Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life to begin this journey of having a different spirit Say these words after me. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son and that you sent him to die for my sin. Jesus Christ, I thank you for coming to the earth, for paying the punishment for my sin when you were crucified. You were buried in a tomb. But according to the Bible, you rose from the dead on the third day. And you did that to give me eternal life. Come into my heart. I receive you as Savior. And I confess you as Lord. From this moment forward, I belong to you. I am a new creation. I have been born again. I am yours. And you are mine. In Jesus' name. I want you to join me now with the communion and the verse that uh, I, I really want to leave with you is from Psalm 116 and it's something that David said um, he said how do I respond to God how do I respond to his goodness in fact in verse 12 he said Psalm 116 what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me how do I respond to God's goodness? How do I respond to his mercy and to his favor? And he says in verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And this, this bread and this juice uh, is an opportunity for us to do that. As we receive the bread, believe God for everything that he's provided. And as you take the cup, don't believe for the least. Because the way we honor God is to believe him for the most, his richest and best, all that Jesus has provided for us. And I, I've often said this when we receive communion at church, that this bread represents the seen part of Jesus' body. And it's the material part of our life, the physical part of our life. And this juice, it represents the unseen part of Jesus' body his blood that was shed for us and there's an unseen part to our life and I want us to understand that God cares about the material the temporal and the, and the seen and he cares about the unseen the heart the emotions and he wants us to be strong in the seen area and in the unseen areas of our life so father we just want to say thank you that you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Jesus came that we might have an abundance of life in the seen and in the unseen. As we take this bread, we say yes and amen in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we take this drink, we say yes and amen to the promises of God 
for the unseen areas of our life. That we might be whole and strong in spirit and in soul and in body. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again. Well, wasn't that a fantastic word that we've heard from Pastor Aaron this morning? How to have a strong spirit. I want to encourage you today, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us through our website, drop us an email. We would love to know who you are and have that connection. Also, why don't you tag your friend in to join us on a Sunday morning and put a like up there and start having conversation about church on Sunday. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to gather together as a church and to bring our friends along the journey. God bless you church. We love you. We pray for you. Have a fantastic week.